So I would like to welcome uh, all to this um, CIB uh, Virtual Computational Biology Seminar. Today we have the pleasure to have uh, Jörg Stelling uh, leading the Computational Systems Biology of the Department of Biosystems Science and Engineering uh, at the ETH uh, Zurich, but in Basel. Um, Jörg studied uh, biotechnology at the, university, at the Technical University of uh, Braunschweig in Germany. Uh, with an intermediary stay at the Ecole Normale Supérieure d'Agronomie in Montpellier. He received his PhD in Systems uh, Biology in 2004 from the Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of Stuttgart in Germany as well. And uh, his PhD thesis devised new methods for the analy analysis of robustness in complex biological networks. Um, and in 2005, he joined the ETH Zurich as an assistant professor for bioinformatics in the computer science department. And since 2008, Jörg is an uh, associate professor for computational systems biology in the department of biosystem science and engineering, as I say, in the ETH uh, Zurich in Basel. And his group is also part of uh, the SIB, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. Um, so the Jörg's group comprises biologists, computer scientists, engineering, and mathematicians uh, who perform interdisciplinary research in systems and synthetics biology. The group focuses on developing and apply, applying computational um, methods and mechanistic mathematical models to study complex cellular networks. Um, the group uh, bi biological application rely on the group, uh, group experimental uh, biology part, that uses uh, yeast as a budding yeast as a model organism and on various external collaboration. So today, Jörg will tell us uh, about multi-scale multi models for the design of synthetic gene circuits. Uh, Jörg, thanks again for accepting this invitation, and the floor is yours. Okay, thanks again for the invitation and for the <clears throat> nice introduction. Um, I picked a topic that I think I didn't talk about yet here in Lausanne, <clears throat> which is um, different from the normal work on metabolic networks or other things we work on. And so the idea here is to use mathematical models in order to construct new biology. <clears throat> so this synthetic biology type of approach, and I'll show a few examples on synthetic gene circuits today. <clears throat> so the basic idea of this field, synthetic biology, is essentially to industrialize fabrication in biology, design and fabrication in biology, so that eventually uh, you will do most of the design uh, using computer-aided design methods, using large libraries of parts you can use for the design, and then eventually send this design, test it virtually, send it to a robot, it gets assembled, and you make very complex products. So that's the, the vision or the theory. And, and really the engineering ideas here are shown like this, so you, the idea is to operate with modules, so well-characterized parts that have defined interfaces, defined input-output relations, and then you can do plug-and-play as you would do with software, for example. Okay, so that's uh, the idea. And also many of the analogies for this field are drawn from engineering, a lot from digital circuit design. And so think of this here as, as a hierarchy, you have a computer chip, at the lower level you have transistors, but you don't want to design a transistor based on, essentially, uh, a computer chip based on the individual transistor characteristics. And so you have intermediary uh, layers of obstruction like logic gates, and from this you construct the chip, and from this you construct uh, software based on top of this. And so the analogy with biology that is often made is that uh, Okay, so the signaling pathway, for example, would be based on molecular interactions, <clears throat> but these signaling pathways would act like logical gates, but only in biology. And the open question is essentially at which level we have to use which type of description, and in the end, whether we can really do this design in a modular way as we could do in software or traditional engineering. <clears throat> so what you can think about <clears throat> in terms of how to engineer organisms now if you start with the wild type here on the left-hand side, simple things that are also done routinely in biology, for example, are just modifying individual interactions. So, for instance, knocking this one out and making a new connection in this existing network. And you can think about integrating a new part or trying to make these things a little bit separate, partially autonomous. And the other extreme, it would be much more synthetic. So uh, the ultimate thing would be to build a synthetic cell that is completely reprogrammed. 
Yeah, so this would be the wire type. This is the most synthetic um, circuit. So the problem with this approach is essentially that <coughs> in biology, these, these modular ideas, nice interfaces between uh, different parts, they actually do not really hold. Uh, so if you have, say, a circuit like this here, so this symbolizes genes, and then essentially what happens is that they are not, they are not autonomous. So in the minimal interactions with the cell or the host are required, for instance, load on ribosomes, on polymerases, on energy. Um, so there's some sort of context dependence, unlike in electrical engineering, at least in digital electrical engineering. Um, another question you might ask is if you want to rewire existing cell signaling circuits um, and you want to simplify a cell, so how can we do this? Can we do minimal replacements of complicated biologies, for example, here? And the third question pertains to uh, this picture here. So this is a cell, a host cell. What happens beyond a cell? So if you have multicellular organisms, you want to do, uh, say, synthetic biology approaches for curing diseases in humans, then you're definitely not acting at the cell level. So these are the, the three questions I want to address with sort of uh, examples today. Uh, first of all, to what extent can we design something that is autonomous, well-controlled um, entities in a, in a biological system? And the next question, okay, can we understand essentially design principles or what would be minimal functions we would need to implement and test this? And the third question is, can we scale this up to uh, essentially higher levels, control entire organisms in the end? And please interrupt at any point if you have questions. Yeah, so there's a microphone here as well. Okay, so the first part, and this is the caveat here for the entire talk, so we use a lot of mathematical models. These are wrong by definition. <clears throat> and what I want to show you is that even rather simple models in this box <clears throat> quote here can, can be useful for our purpose, and that's design. It's not understanding in detail what biology does. Okay, so the first part, uh, specific examples, what we try to do is look at this example of whether simple biological components, in this case a transcription factor that we try to design, whether it can, this can have predictable behavior even if it has to interact with the host, if it needs polymerases and ribosomes, etc., in order to execute the functions. And then of course it depends on the host environment, such as the, the host growth rate. So the basic idea here was the following. So we want to have a yeast cell where we have a synthetic design transcription factor, this one here, that we can influence with an external signal, in this case beta estradiol, such that we can control gene expression of a target gene in a very precise and reliable manner. So the design of this transcription factor here is essentially three parts. It has a DNA binding domain, Lex A, that is, comes from outside yeast. Binding to the promoter, it has an activation of this estrogen receptor domain to interact with estradiol, so that's the input processing domain, and has, has an activation domain that binds to the RNA polymerase. Okay, so the idea is if we add estradiol, we get a predictable output in terms of gene expression for this target gene. Uh, so that's the nice picture that you put as figure one into publications. The reality is, is rather different if you look at the interactions between these different parts. <clears throat> so we have our transcription factor that is supposed to control the open reading frame, the expression here. And this requires polymerase. Polymerase requires polymerase to make polymerase. This all influences is affected by, by growth. So this nice linear pathway here actually doesn't exist in, in reality. And the question now is can we try to capture <clears throat> the main interactions here with the cellular infrastructure and still make this behavior predictable? And so what we did was essentially construct these uh, um, transcription factors, several variants, <clears throat> and used mathematical models, and I'll show you the basic structure in a minute, uh, to evaluate these different design variants. Uh, they all differ only in this activation domain, so the DNA and RNA polymerase binding domain, <clears throat> these two transcription factors here, for example, and the points here are the experimental outputs as a function of the input, so this beta estradiol, and time, and we measure fluorescence report. And you see, even if it's exchange just this domain here, the behavior is quite different in terms of magnitude, <clears throat> but the surface here also tells you that the model quite accurately describes this behavior. 
uh, all together we built four variants <clears throat> and the other two are shown here. And the interesting part of, of these two here is they have much stronger activation domains. And this eventually, when you activate uh, these transcription factors too much over time, will lead to, to cell death, uh, indicated by, by fluorescence that goes down uh, over time. Yeah, so there's an interaction, definitely, even if you ex overexpress a single gene that can drive cells to death. Uh, on the other hand, you may change conditions, in this case, just changing the medium, and this will change growth rate. For example, in glucose, growth, cells grow faster than in glycerol. And the effect is essentially a change in this expression capacity, but you can see that the model captures this quite accurately. Uh, so what is behind this model is essentially a relatively large reaction network. <clears throat> so it's quite detailed. It's an um, ordinary differential equation model uh, based on mass action kinetics. So for example, if you just pick one, one of these reactions here, so this would be the transcription factor bound <clears throat> um, to um, its target. Then polymerase comes and they, they interact with each other. Okay. Uh, so 30 states, 30 variables, <clears throat> the interesting or the uh, critical part here is to explicitly model this infrastructure like polymerase. Uh, and then what we did, we used part of the experimental data in order to identify the, the associated parameters, 45, and then tested against independent data. And the data I showed you before, these are relatively large data sets. So we had roughly 450 data points for training, and then twice as much for, for testing, and that's actually what I showed you in the previous slides. So then the question you can, can ask, um, if you just use the model and use it for predictions, for example, you can ask, can you um, predict the growth rate as a function of the input and for the four different transcription factors? Uh, and this is shown here. So those are the two toxic ones. And actually, you can predict this quite accurately. So there is really an interaction between what happens at the single gene level and the cell. And the model offers you the possibility to look at what happens in more detail. So for example, that's the total polymerase concentration. Here you see that for these toxic transcription factors, this really goes down, simply because uh, the transcription factor captures more polymerase. There's less for making new polymerase, et cetera. And these, <clears throat> these dose response characteristics are not necessarily trivial. And then the last step, we asked what can we do in order to tune essentially this system here. <clears throat> so you might change the, the affinity to the operator. That's what is usually done in engineering transcription factors. <clears throat> but you see the, the effect, the relative fluorescence, so you change by a factor of two or so at most. Whereas when you just multiply the number of, of these binding sites here, <clears throat> and then you can actually achieve something that is pretty much linear. Yeah, so you can really ask how we can modify this quantitatively. Okay. If you have, as I said, if you have any questions, just just ask. <clears throat> yes. Would you uh, expect so because you made a completely deterministic model and for transcription you expect <clears throat> So we see variability, and also what I showed you here is this facts data. <clears throat> here, I show you just the mean and, and variance. So you see over the population, that's not huge. <clears throat> I'll, in the next example, we come to that. No, you cannot do this in general. In this particular example, it works. Yeah? You said that uh, uh, differential equations uh, over the reactions Is there any chance we can study it one by one? Or And the problem is a little bit, yes, in principle, yeah, you can do it. But then if you want to do it in vitro, then you really have to have the right conditions that are the ones that apply in vivo. Otherwise, you measure something that only holds in vitro. This is one example. So this has exactly the same parameters as the model. If you do this, say, in a more glucose metabolic state compared to a glycerol metabolic state, you may simply estimate your parameters well. Okay, <clears throat> so let's go to a bit more noise. 
So the question, so this was just a single component, now we're trying to go towards a circuit. <clears throat> and the question behind with this was, can we do minimal replicas of natural circuits? Or put it the other way around, <clears throat> if you can uh, make a replica that has essentially the same function as the natural circuit, this gives you an idea of what is really important in the natural circuit. <clears throat> so the we had two examples. <clears throat> They're both related to metabolic control, and the basic feature of those is <clears throat> We have uptake of a nutrient, so this is E. coli, this is um, yeast, cerevisin. And we have uptake of a nutrient that is normally not present, and so the uptake systems are suppressed when, for example, glucose is there. But if there's enough, in this case, lactose or galactose, the, the control system switches this on, and then the cells are either in one of two states, either no expression of this entire system or fully on. Okay, and uh, this works by having a transporter that is expressed, expression is controlled, and essentially here we have a number of uh, intermediary steps that process the signal. And we have feedbacks. Okay, so the basic structure here in E. coli is simpler than this one here in yeast. And the main question we asked, okay, so what's essential here? Is this part essential? Is any of these here essential? Or which of the feedbacks are essential? So when you overlay this and try to come up with a common, common design here, then it's essentially this one. We have something that induces the uptake. We have the transporter, the permease. This then will in, uh, lead to this inducer here in the middle that relieves the repressor that uh, represses permease otherwise, and then you have a positive feedback overall in this circuit. Okay, so that's what we tried to replicate. <clears throat> um, just this little positive feedback circuit. And the way how we did this, we, we built this all synthetically, so with components, so this is again in yeast, but with the components that do not exist in yeast. And the, the first step was making this replica here, so the essentially the circuit diagram without the feedback. This is all constructed here. We have a reporter citron, and we just characterize the steady state input output, so the dose response relationship for this particular construct. Okay, so without uh, the transporter, which is this one here, you don't get any fluorescence, no uptake of the uh, of IPTG in this particular example, and otherwise you get the, the fluorescence here. Okay, so from this again, uh, we try to identify a mathematical model for this part, and also later use this to tune the circuit. And then we just took the same model and asked uh, what happens when you close this feedback. Okay, so the circuit is now a little bit extended. The only thing that is different here is that instead of the reporter, we have the transporter here. And the reporter is essentially in parallel, so that we can see what happens in the cells. Uh, so the previous configuration, so this linear one was open loop. Uh, then we have the closed loop with this feedback here. And what is shown here in this pictures are essentially as a function of the input concentration. <clears throat> These are population, cell population distributions measured by facts, <clears throat> fluorescences, and this one is the experimental data, and this is the model simulation. Okay, so we use open loop data in order to identify the model, uh, then put in both in reality and in theory this loop, the feedback, and then you ask what would happen, and what you see here in this experimental data as well as in the, in the model, this is essentially we get signatures of a bistable system system that can exist in two different states. So you have a subpopulation here that is, has low fluorescence, another one has high fluorescence, and eventually this moves to full fluorescence. Another hallmark of this switching device is the following. You can start with high concentrations of the input or start with low concentrations, and the system should have dynamic memory. It's called hysteresis. So for instance, here at this concentration here, if you start with low, input, and then the cells will stay in low input. If you start with high input, then some cells will move to low output, but a lot of them stay in the high state. Yeah, so there's really memory and hysteresis in the system. <clears throat> so that's, yeah. Uh, so in the experimental data for the closed loop, you have that in interesting bimodal distribution starting for zero microgram and yeah. thousand microgram, right? In this window here. Yeah. Do you have any 
suspicion where that comes from or is it some it comes other from, from this system here when you close the loop that it is essentially for the same input it can exist in one of two states so either high or low at the individual cell level <clears throat> this depends on the history and now if you have a mixture uh, some then some of the cells may stay in the high state if they started in the high state some others may go to the low state and the reason for this is that we have stochastic gene expression okay that's so what happens here in the experimental system uh, when you for instance make an upshift you start with low concentration and then go to a high concentration then cells will definitely react differently in terms of when and also to what extent they induce expression. Uh, that's the corresponding simulations from the model, and this also is different from whether you start high or you start low. Okay. So what we can do then now is, for example, this type of experiments uh, that's in silico now. You start from a stationary, one of these bimodal distributions, uh, split it, and one, one part here is off, one part is on, and then you ask how will they develop over time. And what you see here is they converge to the same stationary distribution <clears throat> again. And then you can ask what are the switching rates, so the rates of random transitions between one and the other state. And you cannot uh, directly infer this from the experimental data. So this is shown here. So essentially the, these rates depend on, on the input concentration. And you can infer this using the mathematical model. Yeah, so in this case, definitely <clears throat> stochastic gene expression is the most important thing. Okay, so the bottom line of this here is <clears throat> what this tells us is essentially in these complicated real world circuits, this small loop here may be sufficient to explain at least this basic behavior of having different phenotypes, of having memory in the system. And on the other hand, it's a new design for making a switch in biology. Clear or questions? Okay, I have a third part, and this now really goes towards <clears throat> this question, how do we scale from a single gene to a circuit to essentially an entire organism if you eventually want to control what the entire organism does? <clears throat> so we modify something in a subset of cells or in a single cell and want to influence the entire organism. So that's something that <clears throat> in engineering would call embedded control. So you embed a controller into some device like a washing machine or whatever. <clears throat> and here we look at this in terms of medical applications. So the, uh, we've been working on this for quite some time. So this is now in mammalian cells. So this is collaborative work with <clears throat> Martin Fusnegger. And just to give you a little bit idea, so what we try to do here is essentially just um, building a time delay device in mammalian cells. But that's really just at the cell level. So you want a cell to switch on a particular output, say the production of a particular target protein, only after a certain time delay, or building an oscillator, again, in single cells, but nothing um, interfacing between different types of cells, or a cell and an organism. And that was essentially the first thing where we thought about this. So we have essentially two types of cells, <clears throat> these ones here, so they are essentially sender or receiver cells. <clears throat> they do both of this. They sing, send signals, metabolic signals in this case. <clears throat> we have a other type of cell that processes the signal and gives the signal back. So this is now going from single cells or single cell types to <clears throat> engineering essentially something that may in the end look like an ecosystem if you do this for microbes or something that is <clears throat> relevant for medical applications. So the critical part here is really how to either avoid interfaces with the natural system in these two left examples, or to actually engineer it in a way such that, again, you get predictable behavior, predictable control. So the example I want to show you in a little more detail is related to type 1 diabetes treatment. So probably everybody knows that this is a chronic disease and that it has huge health costs. And so the underlying reason here is that essentially there is no production of insulin. Uh, so in the, because the beta cells are gone um, that produce insulin. So the normal physiological control is that uh, insulin essentially leads to um, uptake of glucose and, and glucose metabolism, 
when there's too much and there's interactions between the uh, glucose and blood and, and brain. Uh, so beta cells sense glucose, secrete insulin depending on the glucose level, and by this achieve a steady state of glucose in the blood. That's the basic control. Okay. Uh, and especially, um, so for type 1 diabetes patients, they have excessive blood glucose because they cannot produce insulin. And this has also has um, potentially drastic consequences because then uh, cells that need, need energy may switch to uh, uh, fat in, fat-based um, metabolism instead of glucose-based metabolism if the insulin dosage is not right. And so what you get is essentially accumulation of acids, and this is called um, acidosis. And this can be potentially lethal, especially if this goes over the goes to the brain. Yeah, so it's, it's really important to control this in an, in an um, in a tight tight range, the blood glucose levels. On the other hand, what you can can do is actually you can try to exploit this mechanism here in order to sense what happens in the in the blood system. And the reason why why this is important is the following. <clears throat> so treatment options for type 1 diabetes are essentially uh, insulin injections, either manually or with automated systems, but they still have a lot of problems, one, one being non-compliance or that the systems simply do not, do not really work or that they work, <clears throat> they adjust um, dosages too late, etc. So what you might want to design in terms of biology is essentially a cell that, that you can that acts like a beta cell, so senses glucose and <clears throat> produces insulin appropriately, and that it can then encapsulate, so mammalian cells encapsulate them in some gel, gel and then implant them under the skin, and they do the, <clears throat> the control really in real time or in a physiological way. That's the, that's the vision. <clears throat> the problem with this is simply that uh, there are no, so in order to do this, you have to sense glucose in the blood. But there are no appropriate glucose sensors now. Okay, <clears throat> so in the first iteration of trying to design something that works, at least in this control loop, works like a beta cell, uh, we looked at the following idea. So it relies on what happens in metabolism when, <clears throat> when, when there's too much glucose. So said then cells will, other cells in the body will change their metabolism, switch to fatty acid metabolism essentially, and this will lead to an increased acid load in the bloodstream. <clears throat> so there is a natural buffer system, so that's bicarbonate uh, in, in the blood, but this only holds for, for a certain range. So eventually there will be uh, um, a lower pH, so too many H plus ions in the blood, and there may be ways of detecting those. So you detect uh, the effect of insulin misregulation indirectly by measuring the blood pH. That's the basic idea. And this is now uh, the resulting circuit here. So this is a, essentially a pH sensor. So this is engineered. It comes from a different, uh, different type of cells. This is then wired into a natural signaling pathway, this one here, so protein kinase A signaling in mammalian cells. And then we take the output of the signaling pathway and reroute this to control a gene of interest. Yeah, so these mammalian cells are modified only by uh, expressing the sensor here and by expressing a sensor that for, for this signal here and then producing a protein of interest in response. Okay. And the problem here and the reason why, why this is requires really quantitative description here is you, you have to have exactly the right response and the right pH range to produce eventually the right amount of insulin. Uh, so again, we, uh, we try to do this using a lot of mathematical modeling, and that's the basic idea, the basic setup. Uh, so we have these modified mammalian cells that I showed you in the previous slide, and they uh, have this sensor, components engineered, but and they control gene expression, but they also have, again, their own metabolism, etc. So what you can then do in vitro, just with these cells, is, for instance, modify the medium pH and see how they respond, try to capture this quantitatively, and then design the cells in such a way that they would do the right thing also when they are in the, in the body. 
Okay, so we use this part in vivo characterization with a reporter protein here in order to build a model and then try to use this model, exactly the same model, uh, to predict what happens when you now produce insulin instead of this one here. And for that, we have essentially a very simplified model of what happens in the, in the body. So it's a concatenation of different models from physiology. And this is now from the mouse with the appropriate interfaces, but in the end, what, what it does, it models the response to insulin, or how this affects glucose, then glucose will affect the body metabolism in terms of how much CO2 is produced, which is important for the buffer, and how many acids. Then we have a model for how this will affect the pH in the body, and this feed, feeds back to the to our synthetic cells. Okay, so that's really uh, multiple scales going from these single cells to the entire body. And the challenge is to have a model that is good enough uh, such that you can do the identification here and then just plug it into another model to predict what happens in, in vivo. Okay, so just to walk you a little bit through the steps here. So again, the, the lines are model simulations, the dots are data. Uh, so first of all, the idea was to characterize how the sensor is responsive to pH changes. This red bar here, that's the natural physiological pH. And essentially here you see that it does what it should. So essentially it increases protein production when the pH is a bit below uh, the natural pH in the blood. And this is an experiment and simulations that tell you that this is actually reversible. So here you change uh, the pH, it goes up, then you change it again, it goes down, etc. So this is the type of characterization experiments. <clears throat> um, we have a signal transduction pathway in the middle, so we have to, a natural signal transduction pathway, so we have to characterize this one as well. <clears throat> so what you, what is done here is essentially two different pHs, the, the sensor should report uh, differently, and then you get increased protein production in the one case, so you have the full dynamics and it's low in the other case. And this is now essentially a dynamic experiment where we vary the dose by modifying the induction time. And what you, when you put these two experiments together, what you will find, you cannot just describe this natural signaling pathway just as a linear type of um, signal propagation. What you need to do is describe it in this type of way. So we have an input here, X, which activates Z. So for instance, this protein here. But there's some dynamics here in the middle that essentially leads to something that is called an incoherent feedforward forward loop. So what this does, when you increase the input here, eventually the system will adapt always to the same steady state. Yeah, so that's now inference on what happens in biology, but we need this part in order to describe the data. Okay, just to give an idea of what type of experiments you can do characterizing in vitro, so this relies essentially on the interplay between uh, acids and CO2, which is the buffer in the, in the blood. You can also modify this in vitro and change carbon dioxide concentration at different buffer concentrations here. And the point about this slide is mostly that in many cases the model characterizes this or is, is very much consistent with the data. Uh, so then what we did, uh, so we had, this was used to establish this model here, and then we plug it into a, a mouse model. So a model representing basic physiology of the mouse. Okay. And there were parallel experiments. So this is now essentially the sensor characterization in terms of an output. This is insulin now. But when the cells are implanted in the mouse. Okay, and you see that with the same model, the behavior is now nearly the same, and the data and, and model, again, uh, look pretty uh, consistent. <clears throat> the implants were then done in healthy mice and type 1 diabetes mice. So the circuit is called pH guard. <clears throat> and what happens in healthy mice, essentially, okay, so you have this pH guard. It changes the insulin a little bit up, but not much different from, from the natural when you give it placebo. But in type 1 diabetes mice, the placebo essentially produces no insulin, whereas this one here produces insulin. And essentially here you see the time courses, time course data. So this is for the natural response to in glucose injection and the glucose level in the blood. So that's how 
healthy cells would respond. That's how type 1 diabetic cells respond. So they start from very much higher concentrations, and they essentially have a hard time down-regulating this again. And this is now the circuit here. So that's the experimental data. <clears throat> so the mice with the circuit, and this is the model simulations. Yeah, so you see the really the dynamics also is, is very much changed. OK, so what you can then do, uh, just use the model, ask, OK, so how safe would it be in a real implant situation if you, for instance, don't know that there is zero production of insulin in the native system? Uh, so would this affect insulin levels? or glucose levels, would they still be in the tolerable range? And the answer from these many simulations is essentially that, yes, you would not predict that, for instance, these insulin levels reach extremely critical values or that the pH goes extremely down. Okay, and then just two more slides on essentially a second generation of this type of ideas. Um, and the idea is now to use direct sensing of glucose instead of the surrogate signal uh, pH. Uh, so the way how real beta cells do this <clears throat> is the following. So uh, when there's low glucose, then there's essentially no metabolism of glucose. Uh, and metabolism via ATP interacts with calcium and uh, potassium channels in the, in the cells. Okay, so when glucose comes, uh, ATP is produced. This leads to, op to inhibition of this um, calcium uh, potassium efflux. The cells depolarize. This will lead to influx of calcium. This will then lead to release of insulin in nat natural beta cells. And the idea here is now to just take different cell types and engineer them in such a way that we can uh, follow the same logic. And the interesting part here was essentially that only this, this calcium pump <laughs> needs to be in, included <laughs> and a particular transcription factor in order to recapitulate <clears throat> the beta cell biology. <clears throat> and you have to do it in the right amounts, et cetera, to be quantitative. Okay, so just the result, essentially the main result. <clears throat> this is a test in this configuration, so we only have these two constructs here, synthetic constructs. <clears throat> we challenge this with extracellular glucose, then insulin is produced. And this is now time course data. The scale is days. And overall, the, the experiment was six weeks. If you have uh, wild-type cells, this is, again, glucose concentration in the blood. They have really normal concentrations. Uh, if you have the control cells for type 1 di diabetes, you see these huge uh, um, high insulin levels in the control mice, and the reason why the time course here is so short that simply most of the, or most of the mice die under these conditions. <clears throat> and when we use this implant, which is called HEC1 beta, <clears throat> the blue lines you see essentially you make a initial perturbation when the, when you implant this to the to the mice, but eventually it it goes to reasonable levels of <clears throat> of blood sugar, and the mice live for at least six weeks. And the final curve here, so this, <clears throat> this is an implant with um, beta cells derived from humans. And you see, <clears throat> essentially, that's, that's they're a little bit worse than, than these engineered cells. OK, so that's essentially it. So what, what I wanted to show you is that you can actually do model-based design, even if, you, if we don't know a lot about the bi biology. The question of how much biology you have to include or what level of abstraction is possible really depends on the context or the purpose of these models. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of methods, what I showed you, especially in the last part, um, this is sort of um, an art how to do this type of uh, model development and, and interfacing all this. The question is how can we do this more systematically? Um, that's really an open question, and, and then what I want to show you, so this idea of having physiological feedback, so really implants with these design cells, uh, this may, may be an opportunity for applications, but also in terms of theory, because essentially these models I showed you, although they try to describe what happens in an entire mouse, they're relatively simple, yeah? because simply the, the organism has a lot of control <coughs> circuits itself, so you may get away with very inaccurate models. OK, so the people who did this work uh, from, from my group are listed here. So this, especially the last part, was a long-standing collaboration with Martin Frisenegger's group. 
in this uh, NCCR molecular systems engineering and David Arslan and Minky Shi were the main uh, people on the experimental side for the mammalian work. And that's the final statement.